Like I said, it is a new year. It's a new year. It's the first Sunday of the new year. So I thought it would be a particularly appropriate time to start in on a new sermon series, and we are going to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, which sort of makes sense if you think about it. And so what we're going to do for the next three months is we're going to be hanging out in Genesis. We are not going to be able to do all of Genesis this year. It is a ton, but we're going to spend three months looking at the beginning of Genesis. And so today, probably not shocking to think about what we're going to start with, and that would be creation. Today, we're going to talk about what happened when God created everything. And what we're going to be doing is covering Genesis 1 to 2, 4, A. And I know that's a bit of a dorky thing, but it's really, really important to understand why creation didn't stop at the end of Genesis 1, okay? And it fires me up. But I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But we are going to be covering today Genesis 1 all the way to 2, 4, A. It's going to be a little bit longer sermon than normal, okay? So you've been warned. And there's going to be a lot. So we strapped in. We comfortable? Okay, good. Awesome. So here's what we're going to be looking at. There's going to be a couple things you're going to be different about today and probably the next several sermons. I am going to be using and referencing a book called the Shocken Bible. The Shocken. Anyone have this translation besides me? That's what I thought. So there's a guy, and his name is Everett Fox, and he is a Hebrew scholar. And he decided what he wanted to do is create a translation of the first five books of the Bible that are really, 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 really close to the original Hebrew. And so he wrote this, the five books of Moses. The reason I am going to use this translation is for me, when I read this, and I had read Genesis before, it made it come alive. It made it come alive. And so what I want to do today is I'm going to share it with you. If you don't have it, that's totally cool. I'm actually going to put each verse up here on the screen, and I'm going to go verse by verse because it is so rich. What happens in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and then they're so rich, we're actually going to go verse by verse through it. You are, of course, free to look at your translations, okay? But if you don't want to, you can sit back and relax and just read along with me because we're diving right in to Genesis 1-1. At the beginning of God's creating of the heavens and the earth. First thing I want you to reflect on, just the very beginning, at the beginning of God's creating of heavens and the earth, where's God? You ever thought about this? So God creates heavens, God creates earth. It's like, where is he exactly? He's just somehow transcendent outside of it. He doesn't fit our spatial ideas, right? If I were to tell you I'm creating something, chances are I'm here, what I'm creating is over here. God somehow is outside of heavens, outside of earth, and yet intimately involved with it. And you're going to see that as he speaks to it, as he shapes it, as he molds it. He's outside of us, and yet he's very much inside of us. And it's a really powerful, thrilling idea. And as we're in the beginning, right, we're in the beginning of this new year, you have to, I would hope, be filled with the type of hope and anticipation that you would feel at this part of the Bible. God's going to create something unlimited potential. Like, just think about the creative potential of God. Now, that was at the beginning. What would happen if we offered up to God 2018? We said, God, just you work your will. Not me, not you, not us. God, you create something incredible out of us, imperfect people this year. It's incredible what God can do. Now, when I say God created, you have to understand what this word means. The word is bara, bara, and it can be translated shape or create. In other words, there's something there that God made and then shaped to create something. And this is why many of you have noticed you got this when you came in, okay? It is purple, I'll give you, but this is Play-Doh. Go ahead and pull that out of your little bags if you haven't done it already. Many of you already have, and I'm so thrilled that you did. I am so thrilled that you did. I want you to pull out this little ball of Play-Doh because I have an assignment for all of us. And you have 30 seconds to do it. Everybody got your Play-Doh in hand? You have 30 seconds to create the universe. Go. Some of you are going for it. Well done. 
And some of you are thinking, hey, you got to give me a week. If we're sticking with the creation story, give me one week, right? Three months. It doesn't matter how long I give you. We couldn't do it. I couldn't. I don't care how big a ball of Play-Doh you gave me. I couldn't do it. What God created is a miracle. And I mean you. You. What you're sitting on the air in this room, the lights in this room. Guys, God created a very, very miraculous thing. Now, this Play-Doh, I'm going to give you permission to work on this the remainder of the sermon. Okay? You can, I'm telling you right now, you could even somewhat tune me out for the next half hour and just make something. I don't care what it is. Something in your imagination. The other day, my daughter was sitting there with Play-Doh and she was sticking her finger through it and I was like, what are you making? And she goes, a finger tunnel. It's like, obviously, duh, I'm the stupidest dad ever. Yes, you go. Make something. I don't care if it's a person's head in front of you. You want to make a play do statue, the pastor, whatever it is, make something with this, you guys. When we create, we're able to unlock a little bit of the image of God in ourselves. So I want to encourage you, just play with that as we keep going, okay? Now, when you got this word heavens, and notice it's heavens, that's used here, especially in Genesis. This is not our usual word heaven. Oftentimes when we use the word heaven, we're talking about that place that we go if we believe in Jesus Christ. That's not the way this word is used. This word is shamayim, and it means heavens or skies, or I love one translation, where fowl flies, where birds fly. The heavens are the skies, the space above the earth, and that's what God created. Yes, there's a heaven, to be clear. But what God is referring to over and over again here is the creation of the sky above the earth and the layers of that. And the other thing you've got to know about the earth is this. This word here is Eretz. Eretz, and it's translated earth or land or ground. The hard stuff. Which means it's not just limited to earth with a capital E. It's everything that is land or ground in the universe. That's what God created. Then verse 2, when the earth was wild and waste, darkness over the face of ocean, rushing spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. Notice what God used to create. This word here is tahan. It's translated formlessness, confusion, unreality, emptiness. God used waste to create a miracle, to create you, to create me, to create this planet. Leave it to God to turn formlessness into form, confusion into order, unreality into reality, and emptiness into fullness. It's what God does. So if there is something in your life that feels like a waste, hand it over to the big guy. Watch what he makes out of it. It'll blow your mind. And when I say big guy, we've got to be careful who's involved here with creation, right? The spirit is involved at the very beginning That spirit over the waters, that's the ruach. This is the spirit, the wind, the breath of God. The Holy Spirit was involved from the very beginning, folks. Doesn't just make an appearance in the New Testament. The spirit was there hovering over the waters, almost as if he's hovering in anticipation of what God is about to do, what they are about to create. So we know we've got Yahweh, we know we have the spirit. And then Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light. And there was light. I want to pause here and remember how God is creating. He spoke into creation. It would be as if we took this Play-Doh and spoke to it, and it did something. I don't have that power. God does. He spoke into creation. With God, words matter, folks. They have life-giving, life-breathing power. And they also have incredibly dangerous effect if we let them. Words matter with God, and we have got to be oh so careful with them. God uses them perfectly, and when he speaks, things are created. Now notice that he created light. So you've got to imagine, before this happened, things must have been really, really dark. And then all of a sudden, God speaks. And it's if he flips on the lights of the universe just with a word that comes from his mouth. And he spoke, and all of a sudden, it was light. 
And then God saw the light, that it was good. God separated the light from the darkness. So from this, we can learn, right, that light is good and dark is bad. Oh, wait a minute. No, we can't. Notice that. The light is good. The dark is just separated from light and dark. That whole dark and evil thing, that happens later, folks. God creates light, says it's good, and he says that dark thing, we're going to have to separate that, right? But there's actually some good things that can happen in the dark, and so God creates light, God creates dark, and he actually created things to rule the light and the dark, and that's coming, Genesis 1-5. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was setting, there was dawning, one day. So note what happens. One day, God has the setting of the sun, and he has a dawning of the sun, and there's one day, which is proof to me that God is way better than I am. If I had been creating the universe, I would have taken my stuff, my matter that I was going to use, and said, I'm going to knock this out in one day. I'm going to just push through. I'm going to do an all-nighter, and I'm going to do this whole thing in one day. And yet God creates, and he says, I'm going to create a day and a night, and I'm going to use several of those to get this done. I'm going to create a system that is self-limiting, and I, God, am going to live by that. That's humility, folks. If God wanted to create in one day, he could have, but he didn't. He created a system and then lived within it, and then he puts us in it and says, no, you live in it. I give you a day and I give you a night, I'm going to give you a bunch of them. Live in that system. Genesis 1, 6, God said, Let there be a dome amid the waters, and let it separate waters from waters. Now, when you think about a dome, I don't want you to think about this one. You guys have read this crazy Stephen King book or seen the television series. That is not the dome we're talking about, okay? The dome that's being described here is something more of what I think of as an atmosphere, okay? You have this space, this series of atmospheric pressures around the earth, and each planet has one of these, right? And this is a breakdown of what our atmosphere looks like with the troposphere and the stratosphere, the mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. It's this series of layers around the earth that actually help life exist, help pressures happen, that help weather happen. And God created that system for you and for me. And then in 1, uh, 7, 8, we get God made the dome and separated the waters that were below the dome from the waters that were above the dome. It was so. God called the dome heaven. There was setting, there was dawning, second day. Now when I think about this is what I picture. Because remember, right, all we can see this far is water, and then we've got water that God has separated and put above us. Now as Oregonians, we know this well. Right? Do you realize that you walked in under the creative rain potential of God? You walked in under the heavenly protection of God. He actually kept that rain up in that gray cloud so that it didn't fall on you. God did that. And if he wants to make it fall, he can. And we know this very, very well. But think about that. When you're walking around, when you're driving around under those gray clouds, you are driving under the creative potential and protection of our God. And at this point in creation, we got waters below and we got waters above. And then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered to one place and let the dry land be seen. It was so. And so I picture something a little bit like this. Who knows, right? We have this drawing away of the water and then the land is revealed and seen. It reminds me very much of the parting of the Red Sea. Except this time, God says, I'm just going to part everything. So I got some water here, and I got some land here. And there's this separation that's starting to happen. There's order that's starting to happen. And then God called the dry land earth. And the gathering of the waters he called seas. God saw that it was good. And we start to get a glimpse of what we get to see today. That absolutely gorgeous image that is our planet. Water, land, heavens. And then God said, let the earth sprout forth with sprouting growth. Plants that seed forth seeds, fruit trees that yield fruit after their kind, and in which is their seed upon the earth. It was so. Won't you notice something about this whole seed thing? God's creation is designed to sprout. God's creation is self-replicating. Think about it. 
God created flowers and plants and designed them such that seeds would fall and make more. How awesome is our God? God could have said, I'm going to create some stuff, and then in a year, I'm going to come in and create some more stuff. Because God can do that. But God said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create it and let it take care of itself, regenerate itself, and watch what it can do. And that's just the plants, folks. Animals, people are still to come. We are designed to sprout, to keep going. Verse 12 and 13, the earth brought forth sprouting growth. Plants that seed forth seeds after their kind. Trees that yield fruit in which is their seed after their kind. God saw that it was good. There was setting. There was dawning. Third day. You guys notice that the earth is following God's instructions? You ever thought about the obedience of the earth? I've never once heard the earth look at God and say, you know what? This year we're going to do it differently. We're not going to do that whole spring, summer, fall business. God, we're going to do it a little bit differently. The earth is remarkably obedient to God. We count on it. And when it doesn't happen, we talk about it a lot. Think about the difference in weather between this year and last year. But it's the same general pattern, the same general cycle. I think the earth sometimes listens to God way better than we do. And we should pay attention when the earth continues to replicate and move and grow and allow seasons to change it and then come right back around again. We should be as obedient to God as the earth often is. And you'll notice that God says something here, and you're going to see that saying over and over again, God saw that it was good. God's got his own review process every single day. He looks at what he's done, he's like, yeah, that's good. Like in the best sense of the word good. To me, this is a little bit convicting. Are we reviewing everything we do and say to ensure that it is good? Have you looked back at 2017 and said, was that good? And where it wasn't, do we try to fix it? Apologize for it? Correct it? Not do it again in 2018? That's what God does every day. Do we do it at the end of our days? Do we look back at our day, right, that process of examining and say, "Did, did I do everything good today? And when I didn't, try to fix it and not do it again the very next day. That's what God does every day. He reviews it and says, that was good. And then 14, God said, let there be lights in the dome of the heavens to separate the day from the night, that they may be for signs, for set times, for days, and years. There's a rhythm that's starting to develop, folks. There's an order that's starting to develop. We've now learned about light and dark, day and night, and work, and as we close this passage out, we're going to talk about rest. There is a rhythm in the way God created the universe. There's a rhythm in the way God runs the universe. Do we let God set that rhythm of our lives? Are we obedient to this? Or do we push it because we have the, co- the coffee and the energy drinks and the technology to do so? Or do we say, you know what? It's light, I should probably get up. And it's dark, we should probably start winding down. There is a rhythm with the way God created the universe, and he did it for a reason. Do we let him set the rhythm of our lives, or do we live like I dance? Which is no rhythm at all. Okay? Let's be clear. And no, I'm not going to give you an example. Right? We really do. We need to be obedient to this rhythm of the way God creates and still runs the universe, and let this govern the way we live. Verse 15, and let them be four lights in the dome of the heavens to provide light upon the earth. It was so. Guys, God invented recessed lighting. I love this. You think about it, right? We just kind of got real big. Recessed lighting is really popular. And we've only figured it out the last couple of decades, last few decades, right? But for years and years and years, we were lighting candles. We were putting lights on things. God, a long time ago, was like, stop doing that. Just put it up in the top. That's what he did. With the stars, with the moon, with the sun. He's like, I'm not going to put it down on the earth. I'm going to create these beautiful, gorgeous lights to illuminate you, and I'm not even going to put them on your planet. I'm going to put them up in the sky, in the heavens above you. 
Now, one of the other reasons I bring this up is because, guys, you're recessed lighting. You are recessed lighting. So shine. God put you in your family, in your neighborhood, in your job, in your organization, in your community, in this city, in this state, and said, be a light. But we have to allow ourselves to be turned on for him. He's planted us here. What are we going to do with that? Because we are recessed lighting as well. Verse 16, God made the two great lights, the greater light for ruling the day and the smaller light for ruling the night and the stars. Now as you read this, hopefully you're thinking about the sun and the moon. I want to ask you as a question, is the moon a light? Not really, not technically, right? But it provides incredible light because of the reflection of the sun off of it onto the earth. And if you've been outside in a full moon, you know how powerful that light is. But it gets that light from the sun. I think the same can be said for you and I. I'm not per se a light. Kind of solid. A lot of water. Not a lot of light. If God reflects off of me, I get some illumination, just like the moon. But we have to let him reflect off of us, just as the sun reflects off of the moon and gives us great light. Verses 17 through 19, God placed them in the dome of the heavens to provide light upon the earth, to rule the day and the night, to separate the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. There was setting, there was dawning, fourth day. I love this idea of the moon as night vision. So if you've ever gone out at night when there's been a full moon, you realize how powerful this is. That God literally gave us any, something way more powerful than the streetlights we can use or the flashlights on our phones. And he does it from miles and miles and miles away. God literally gave us the ability to see at night be able to see during the day and see at night. It's a beautiful glimpse of what God can do even in the darkness in our lives. God said, let the waters swarm with a swarm of living beings. And let fowl fly above the earth across the dome of the heavens. I want you to notice the somewhat awkward English word swarm, because it's used twice in one verse. Swarm. The word is sharats. It means swarm, team, have a lot of how many of you guys have been scuba diving? Good. Okay. You realize the power of this statement. Even if you've been snorkeling and you've put your head down below the surface of the ocean and you see everything that's down there and how out of place we are, you get the power of what God did. He filled the ocean. This is the same word that's used to describe what he wants the plants and seeds to do. He wants them to swarm. It's the same thing he wants us to do. He wants us to swarm. And yet if you consider what we've done with overfishing of the earth, and you consider what we've done with the endangerment of many of the species on this planet, we should be really sorry about this. God said, no, no, no. I created this to swarm, to be full, and we have got to take better care of that. Verse 21, God created the great sea serpents. Absolutely, ooh. And all living beings that crawl about with which the waters swarmed after their kind and all winged fowl after their kind, God saw that it was good. God created cool stuff, folks. This word, translated, the word is tanane, and it's translated serpent, dragon, or sea monster. Maybe it's because I'm a dude, but I fascinated about this stuff growing up. I got a three-year-old daughter that talks about dragons. God created these huge sea creatures that even now archaeologists are finding below the surface of the earth with bone structures different than we've seen before. God made that. Those are the sea monsters that God put in the ocean. God makes really, really cool things. Verses 22 and 23, And God blessed them, saying, Bear fruit and be many. And fill the waters and the seas and let the fowl be many on the earth. There was setting, there was dawning, fifth day. A very, very important instruction starts to emerge. Bear fruit and be many. Often translated, be fruitful and multiply. 
And this phrase is used six times in the book of Genesis. We need to get to it. Bear fruit and be many. God did this for the plants. He did this for the animals. And he gives the same instruction to us. Go out there. I'm not worried about overpopulation, says God. If you want to see the impact this is going to have on the world, folks, watch China. I'm serious about this. A few years ago, right, they changed that one child rule, made it two children. Watch what that does in China and how it affects this planet. When we swarm, when we are fruitful and multiply, very powerful things happen. And ultimately, God's in charge of it. Now, the other thing I think is really fascinating about this is that bearing fruit doesn't kill the tree. You ever thought about that? You look at a tree, for example, that bears fruit. Every year, fruit comes from it, and it might struggle for a little bit, right? There's fall and there's winter, and then spring happens, and it does it all over again. And we as people, right, particularly we got to go with mothers here because dads, we can take almost no credit, right? Mothers create these beautiful, incredible children, and it takes everything out of them, and then somehow they're able to do it again. It's amazing that God allows us to bear fruit and to keep doing it. So it might be tiring to bear the fruit of God in our lives, but it doesn't take everything, and God will refill us and let us do it again over and over and over again. Just as with trees and plants and with people, he does it with us. And he says, you better get to it. Bear fruit and be many. Verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth living beings after their kind herd animals, crawling things, and the wildlife of the earth after their kind. It was so. I love that he says, earth bring forth. Picture this. It's as if out of the land all of a sudden emerges. This word is yatsa. It means to go or come out. As if all of a sudden the earth is just issuing up animals. This is a very similar image to what God used to create Adam and Eve. He used the earth. God took the stuff that he made and said, I'm going to use that as ingredients to make something amazing. This makes me think of cooking, right? God has to be the ultimate master chef. You look at ingredients laid out in a table and you're like, that really doesn't look like a whole lot. But if you put them together the right way, a masterpiece is formed. And that's what God did is he had the earth issue forth these animals that came into the world. And God made the wildlife of the earth after their kind and the herd animals after their kind and all crawling things of the soil after their kind. God saw that it was good. Notice that there are three land animal groups as described in the beginning. And I love this because we have biology now, which is a great thing. Right, we've got what? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Did I do that right? Right, kings play chess on fine grain sand. So we've, we've figured out ways of classifying all of our animals and all of our species. But at the beginning, there's three groups. And we got our herd animals, our crawling things, and our wildlife. And I think if we're honest, even though we know biology, we put animals in these three categories all the time. There's like sheep and there's cats and dogs, there's things we domesticate, and then there's the crawling things, like the spiders and the snakes, there's only like a minority the human population even likes, and then there's the wildlife, we've got the wolves, we've got bears, and so you've got, in the beginning, we have this creation of these three groups of animals that we have somewhat separated thanks to biology, but really I think we think in the same type of way when you think about the type of animals that God has given us to enjoy and to take care of. Verse 26, God says, let us make humankind. In our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the heavens, animals, all the earth, and all crawling things that crawl about upon the earth. And then God saved the best for last. Then he made us. After doing all this awesome stuff which we've talked about, which alone should put us in awe, he made your ancestors and he made my ancestors. He saved the best for last. And notice who's involved. He says, let us make us. We've got God. We've talked about that rushing spirit. 
And then guess what, folks? Jesus was involved in creation. Read John 1. Jesus as the Word. Jesus is the Word of God. It's as if when God speaks and creates things, the words that come out of his mouth, thanks to the Spirit, the breath of God, those words are Jesus. Jesus was the spoken element of God that made everything. So notice how God works. He creates in community. All three of them were there. God creates in community, and he designed us to create in community. And others, that we can do more together than we can alone. He said, let us make. Not let me make. Let us make. And then notice, he said, let us make in our image. Not my image. We are made in a communal image. You and I were made in the image of Father, Son, and Spirit. That means that we are multifaceted. You are not a simplistic product of a stereotype or someone's judgment. You are an incredible, multifaceted human being made in the image of a complex, Trinitarian God, and we are not individualists. As much as society is pushing that on us, we are not individualists. And we as Christians, we as the church, have an opportunity to push back and say, no, we are not I. We are we. And we can do more together than we can alone. Folks, we are made in a communal image. Now this image, this is such a hard thing to understand. What does it mean that we are made in God's image? Since we don't even know exactly where he is or what he looks like, what does it mean to be made in God's image? The word is selem, and it means image or likeness, or is sometimes translated in the end of the Old Testament, shadow. It means you and I were made to reflect God. That's what an image does. It shows a reflection of that thing, which means that we're like God in some way, but we're not God. And this idea of a shadow fascinates me. I want to do something with you guys. If you could turn the lights off for me. My, um, my three-year-old often says to me, she goes, let's do shadows, Daddy. And what she means is she's fascinated that I can make a little flashlight come out of my phone and I can do a very sophisticated thing up on the wall. You guys have done shadow puppets, right? And she is fascinated that all of a sudden, with my hands and a light, I can make images on a wall. And so I've done a lot of this. We do a lot of shadows. And I did this, and once I was reflecting as I was doing this, as I was moving the light, which she loves, as I move the light closer to the object, the image gets bigger. And I started to think, wait a minute. As I move the object closer to the light, the image gets bigger. If I move the object of God's affection towards the light of God, his image gets bigger. Guys, if we get closer to God, the image of God reflected on the world gets bigger. Don't miss this opportunity. We've got a whole year ahead of us. May we stay close. Let me turn this off. Let me, may we stay close to God. And the closer you get, the bigger image of him the world sees. And all we got to do is get close. But we got to be close, and that's exactly where he wants us. And once we're close, we got a lot to do. You notice there is an instruction in here. And it gets really clear in the next chapter. We were told to have dominion and rule over the earth. Over all kinds of stuff. Fish, fowl, animals, earth, crawling things. I love that, right? Like crawling things aren't even considered animals. All the stuff on the earth. And God says, you're in charge of it. Don't make me come down there. Right? That's the instruction. He put us in charge of this stuff. And so we better take care of it. We need to be familiar with the idea of creation care. In the beginning, God gave us instructions, said take care of this place. It's as if we're God's maintenance crew. For a time, as long as we're here, we are in charge of taking care of this place. We better do it. And this is going to affect everything. It should. It should affect the amount of water we use, how we recycle. You guys have hopefully noticed by the doors are a couple of blue buckets 
If you're not going to keep your bulletin, let's put it in there and recycle it. This should affect the way we drive our cars, what we put in our cars, how we live our whole life. This is our shared planet. God gave it to us and he put us in charge of it. So we had better take great care of it. That's our assignment. Verse 27, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, did he create it? Male and female. He created them. All right. So God now, we learn, creates a man and a woman and they are created to go together. This is a really powerful thought once it sinks in. This means that according to God, we are most like him when we're with the opposite sex. A man is most like God when he's with a woman, and a woman is most like God when he's with a man. How many of you guys are familiar with this book? A lot of people, right? Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. According to Genesis, no. Men are from God, women are from God, men are from the earth, women are from the earth. And if I get that this book made it pretty clear, right, to many people that men and women are different. But if you needed this book to figure it out, right? God knew what he was doing. God knew what he was doing when he made men a little bit different from women and vice versa. And what he's saying here is you guys are going to understand me. You're going to be most like me you're going to best reflect me when you're together. Not man alone, not woman alone, but together. This is all about community. This is all about unity. God created the male and female together. And then God blessed them. God said to them, bear fruit and be many. There it is again. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the heavens, and all living things that crawl about upon the earth. Subdue it. This is a powerful word, subdue. Subdue is the thing you've been doing to your Play-Doh. Okay? The word is kavash, and it's subdue, bring it into bondage, squeeze it, knead it. In other words, none of you would want to be kavashed. Okay? And God said, I want you to do this. Do it to the earth. I'm putting you in charge. I think this is frankly why storms scare us a little bit. You guys think about just this past week, right? The bomb cyclone that hit the East Coast. Or even you think about 2017, Right, we had some really tragic hurricanes that hit the earth. I don't know about you, but sometimes when that happens, I kind of look up, kind of squint my eyes. I'm like, God, did we mess up? Because that was big. I mean, I know, God, you're in charge of all of this. And you just reminded us of that. You have got this earth under your care. But he has called us to subdue it and to take care of it. And we've got to do a better job of that. Verse 29, God said, Here, I give you all plants that bear seeds that are upon the face of all the earth and all trees in which there is tree fruit that bears seeds. For you shall they be for eating. And also for all the living things of the earth, for all the fowl of the heavens, for all that crawls about upon the earth in which there is living being, all green plants for eating. It was so. So according to these two verses, we were vegetarians at first. Right? There's no meat eating. There's no bloodletting until the flood happened. And we're going to talk about that in several weeks. But just let me remind everyone that when everything was created, we were created and made vegetarians. But then that changed. I'm going to leave it at that and move on. All right, verse 31. Now God saw all that he had made, and here it was exceedingly good. There was setting, there was dawning, the sixth day. Don't miss what is exceedingly good. All of it. I get so tired of hearing Christians, especially pastors, oh, when I hear pastors do this, talk about humankind as if we are exceedingly good. That's not what that verse says. God looked at all of it, including, yes, humankind, the one made in his image, and said, all of it is exceedingly good. The reason this is important is that we as people need to remember we need this earth. We need the plants, we need the animals, and we need to take care of them and have dominion over them. And when we do, 
that's exceedingly good. When we live well within the earth that God gave us, but us alone, we're not exceedingly good. We need each other, and we need this planet that God has given us, and then we work as God intended. But notice, and if you're reading your own Bibles, you've noticed you've hit the end of a chapter, and it drives me bonkers. The creation story is not done. Right? Centuries after the Bible is written, people impose these verses and these chapters, and I get it. It's helpful. It helps me to be able to direct you guys where to look. But where they drop this one drives me nuts because the creation story is not done. God did not create in six days. He created in seven. And we can't forget the seventh day. Genesis 2.1, Thus were finished the heavens and the earth with all of their array. I picture here God like looking at everything. He's like, whoo, that is nice. Look at that. He pauses at the end of six days, at the end of his work. He stopped work in six days, right? He stops and he looks at it and he's like, man, that is good. I love that. Do we do that when we create things? Do we stop and pause and say, wow, look what God has done. Look how we're blessed. I mean, we do that a little bit when it comes to Thanksgiving, right, in November, and then we kind of drop that for the rest of the year. One of the reasons we're doing an annual celebration meeting is to look back over 2017 and say, look what God did. Look how he's blessed us. Just enjoy it. Just pause for a minute to appreciate it. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just find I finish something and I go on to the next thing. I don't pause and look and say, whew, thank God for that. Or, whoops, I should probably fix that. But God didn't make those mistakes, right? He pauses, he appreciates, and then verse 2, God had finished on the seventh day his work that he had made, and then he ceased on the seventh day from all his work that he had made. Day seven is so important to creation. That's why I say God didn't create in six, he created in seven on that seventh day, God's work finished and his rest began. Rest is an important, critical part of creation. And we have forgotten this, folks. And we prove it every day with the way we live our lives. God intentionally stopped work and just rested. We have got to stop bringing work home with us. Whether it's your paid job or the thing that you've been dealing with or stressing about during the day, there needs to come a point in time where we say, I'm stopping. Not because you might feel you need to, but because God told us to and God did when he created. Folks, if God wanted to work seven days, he would have done it. But he didn't. He later told us, right, the Sabbath, I want you to keep it holy. But God didn't first tell us. You notice he first showed us. He said, I want you to stop. I need you guys to understand there comes a point where we stop. I'm going to give you guys a couple examples how I do this. Feel free to take this as you want. You might have different ways of doing this. This is why, for example, I have a work and a personal email. There is a time for me to do work and a time to do something else, and I'm very protective about that. I have been through a period of my life where I was not protective at all, and it was overwhelming. Once we take this seriously, this pattern of work and rest, this will affect everything. When we check our email, when we answer our phone, when we even check our text messages. Yeah, I said it. These things are great. I do. I love my phone. But there's a time you got to turn it off. It doesn't show up at the dinner table at our house. There just needs a point in time where I put it away. And then I pick it back up because day seven is over, right? But we need to allow for this rhythm in our lives when work is finished and rest begins. Verse three, God gave the seventh day his blessing. And he hallowed it, for on it he ceased from all his work that by creating, God had made the seventh day. God calls it blessed, and he calls it something else. The word is kadash, and it means consecrated, set apart, or hallowed. This is often translated holy. God looked at the seventh day and said, this day is holy. Are we treating this day as holy? In case you're wondering, you're in it, Right? Just true, we've chosen Sunday, our Sabbath day, and it's not just the hour that you're here. Hour and ten minutes today. Thanks for hanging with me. All day. Are you resting? 
are you ceasing? You notice this word cease. Cease is an active stopping, okay? Ceasing isn't God running into a wall and not being able to go further. Cease is God making a decision saying, nope, I'm done. Ceasing does not happen by accident. Ceasing is an intentional decision. We say, I'm done for the day. I'm done for the week. I need to pause. I need to rest. Because God did it, and he told me to do it, and it's good for us. Then we get to the end. Verse 4a, you notice it's just the first half of the verse. Those are the beginnings of the heavens and the earth, their being created. It all started with creation, you guys. Think about it. This book could have started with a formed heaven and earth, and animals and people, but the beginning starts with a story about how God created. So my question for you guys, you're going to notice I'm going to ask you a lot of questions in the next several weeks, and I'm not going to necessarily give you the answers for it, because I want you to answer them. I want you to think about it. What are you creating? What have you created with your Play-Doh? On a daily basis, on a weekly basis, what are you creating? And maybe you think, I'm not the creative type. No such thing. I tried that with my mom for years and years and years, and she said, yes, you are. You just don't know what it is yet. Do you guys know what my favorite day of the week is? Probably guess Sunday, right? I'm a pastor. That should be my favorite day. You know it's Monday? You know why Monday is my favorite day? Because that's the day I get to create these. I get to spend time with the Word of God. Monday is my sermon prep day, and I sit with the Word, and I let God speak to me, and I create something that He lets me create. Something happens on Mondays. When we create, we unlock the image of God in us, and He does it with you. So I don't know what it is for you. Maybe you're amazing. You've got a statue in front of you with the Play-Doh. Maybe you're a painter. Maybe you've got an incredible voice. Maybe you do instruments, maybe you do computers, maybe you work with wood, maybe you work with pipes. I don't know what it is. Maybe you make gorgeous spreadsheets. You laugh, but some people are really bad at that. Create, guys. When we create, we unlock the image of God in us. Our God is a God of creation. He created you in that image. And as we take communion today, I want us to celebrate that. I, my hope for all of us is that may communion create in us something new this new year. So let's contemplate that and pray about that before we take communion this morning. God, to call you creative seems like an understatement because none of us know your potential. But we know that you are within your actual. You created us You love us, and you created a planet for us, and you created us for the planet. And I pray that we will do a better job taking care of all of it, because it takes care of us, and you use it for that purpose. God, I pray that we will be a creative people in 2018, that we'll create new things in our lives, in our families, in this church, and in this community, in this city, and in this state, and in this country. Use us to create, God, please. Because you can, we cannot. Please use us. And God, I pray as we take communion, we remember how you create. You create through giving and sacrifice. We pause right now as we take the bread, we remember the body of Jesus Christ, created, broken for us. The blood of Christ, created, poured out for us so that you can be with your creation forever. We thank you. We love you. Please use us to do this in remembrance of you. And it's in Jesus' name we do this and pray. Amen.